Supported by the dwindling rump of Rob's mob, Robert Muldoon kept up a running political battle, particularly with his own party. He would live for eight more years, but hollowed out by the power he'd grown to need, life held little for him. I would sum him up as someone who ought now to be removed. And as Labour roared into power in 84, reforming everything he stood for, he suffered the indignity of becoming a dinosaur overnight. Without the power, he appeared to almost be flailing around, holding on to the past but not really able to move with all the changes that were taking place. He never made the adjustment from power. I don't like this word statesman, I say. And he hated the concept of being a statesman. A statesman's a dead politician. He was going to be a politician till the day he died. Is there a place in this party for you? Well, uh, if it doesn't change, there won't be a national party. If it does change, well, uh, I'm back where I started. What Rob Muldoon tried to do was to protect the lot of the ordinary New Zealander, the ordinary bloke, as he used to refer to them as. He wanted to be remembered as a person who left New Zealand no worse than he found it. He was very realistic um, and humble. Uh, that was actually the statement of a humble man. My own view is that he did leave it with substantial problems and substantial dilemmas which have taken us a lot of time and no little anguish to sort out. But I think he left New Zealand um, the richer for his presence. On the one hand, a very strong politician with a, but on the other hand, somebody who simply got the economic strategy badly wrong. His impact on our politics, I think, was not uh, for the best because it lowered uh, standards. Uh, people became much more combative. The Muldoon legacy wasn't all bad. His reign was cynical, but he taught an adolescent country to grow up politically. The blatant manipulation of the, uh, the Springbok issue was quite harmful to, to New Zealand in a way, but on the other hand, it, it was quite revealing, I think. I think that New Zealand suddenly found and was perhaps a bit frightened about how, how racist and about how... Um, how uh, bigoted it could be in that, uh, in that whole experience. So that it, it was a contribution to, I think, of us finding out more about ourselves. We saw this, didn't we? He taught some of us never to believe in strong leaders who promise everything. When Labor Party it's just a lesson for a, a democratic electorate. Don't rely on your leaders. They cannot walk on water and do not leave them too long in power. You can't expect even a good Prime Minister to know when is enough. Family was suggesting at various stages that maybe you should think about retiring, <laughs> um, but uh, that's not the sort of person he was. I think we should do something like the United States does. Give a leader a certain set of times. The President of the United States can have two terms of four years, a total of eight. Good evening and welcome to the Friday Frights. Count Robula at your service. Ever anxious to reach out publicly in a way he never could privately, he embarked on a strange retirement career in show business. He was quite a lonely person, really, and quite a, a sad person. Sweet dreams. <laughs> I don't think that he was able to be very warm, but I think that he was quite desperate to be to be liked. The law's hardly drafted before it's in the house and they're... He continued to talk to Rob's mob on his own radio show, Lilies and Other Things, and won two awards. He couldn't even talk about gardening without sort of ripping someone's guts out. Radio Pacific was the one thing that he really enjoyed. Blood and guts coming through your headset while you can actually sort of look at your flowers going. In 1988, he had surgery for bowel cancer. In 1989, he had a heart valve replaced. And within minutes of leaving hospital, Sir Robert was firing salvos at the government. He was a terrible patient. He was discourteous to the, the nurses. Luckily, Barbara, his daughter, who was on the floor above, and a, uh, a specialist in heart problems, would come down. He was very ill, and it was a very frightening thing for him and a very concerning thing for the rest of the family. But I used to have to speak to uh, Sir Robert very firmly but now and then because he, he wouldn't have a shave of a morning. Uh, he wouldn't do as the nurses told him. He certainly didn't enjoy being in hospital. 
As he watched Keith Holyoke's statue unveiled three months later, Robert Muldoon had no illusions about how he would be remembered. They won't put up a statue to me. <laughs> no, 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 nobody's got that sense of humour. A year after National regained power, he was tired, dissatisfied with his backbench role and angry with the new government. And I think towards the end when he realised that, that the next generation of, of bright young people, the Richardsons, the, the Uptons, were now calling the shots and were actually burying everything that he ever believed in and, and gone. That really was the last straw for him. I came here to help people, not to hurt people. And I find that it has not been possible for me this year to stop too many people being hurt. In November 1991, he finally announced his retirement. There was a lady walking down the pavement, and uh, as we passed, she stopped. She said, I know you, don't I? I said, um, my name's Muldoon. You're not related to that bastard in Parliament, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and on that salutary note, Mr. Speaker, I say... Then it was time for more personal farewells to the man who dominated New Zealand politics for so long. Less than a year later, he was dead. And as he was laid to rest on the 7th of August 1992, there was relief among those who'd been close to him. Well, I sometimes remember the good things and... Sometimes I think, well, I'm lucky that he didn't end up an invalid. I felt a bit of relief. I felt that he had uh, been extraordinarily demanding on his own family. Uh, and uh, and uh, life had been pretty rugged, I believe, for all of them and his family. It would have been awful for me. I couldn't have coped. And I know so many other women who have had husbands who have ended up invalids for about five years. I couldn't have coped with that. I think he knew he was going to die, and I think he was ready to die. Um, and all around it was a relief. A long time back, uh, Simmons and I had made a pact that one of us would make sure that we went to the funeral, and we would make sure that he was well and truly six foot under. And, uh, and then it fell on me to be there, so I was at the funeral. Sadly unmourned by many New Zealanders, Robert Muldoon died a tragic figure. He promised us everything, but simply showed us the grim face of power. Well, I guess one always thinks when you're first married that eventually you will get old, but you will spend time together doing the things that you used to do when there were just two of you before children, and that that was never going to be. And I think that was the sadness of it. It's, it's the Greek hubris. It makes you arrogant. All else becomes indifferent. Friendships, relationships, objectives but the thing that will always i think live with me we've gone a long time if you drive and there were lots of people all the way around the route um and coming into Napapi road there was an elderly gentleman in, a, in his pajamas and dressing gown um standing by the side of the road and saluting and crying there'll always be a rob's mob <laughs>